On Two Wheels this week, more from the Manchester National Motorcycle Show, where we focus once again on the machines known as street fighters. Big muscle bikes, lots of chrome, turbos and some of the most intricate paint jobs you will ever see. But first, Jeff returns to the National Motorcycle Museum for the final part of his guided tour on the history of the British bike. Now the history of the British motorcycle, we can't possibly cover it all in our programme but what we can do is cover some highlights and significant machines and in the last episode if you were watching I ended up with Triumph Tiger 110 1954. Terrific performer, good turn of speed but the handling left something to be desired. Just look at these front forks, very very spindly. And the frame, it used forged members down here and a rear subframe that was actually bolted on and it made the whole thing pretty flexible. People used to say it had a hinge in the middle. But Norton, they cracked that at the same sort of period because they had this. Now what Norton did through their racing experience was develop two things. One, the front forks. These have got the road holder badge on there because these were the start of really good suspension. Much beefier than the Triumphs, much more substantial, even with alloy bottom sliders there. Very, very neat and it did the job. And excuse me while I just nip across in front, but it also had a feather bed frame. This is a double cradle loop frame. These tubes here, welded onto the headstock, comes right round the bottom of the engine, up the top, curved over here, and back to the headstock. And that's replicated on the other side, so you've got this twin cradle loop frame. Very, very firm. At the back here, the rear subframe is actually welded onto these, not bolted like the Triumph, so it makes the whole lot very, very firm. And this gave such a good ride. When I said firm, what I mean is you ain't going to get any flexing in it. But it gave such a good ride to the TT riders when they used to have the old Manx Norton engine in there that compared with the previous bikes, they actually said this is like riding a feather bed. Hence the name, the famous feather bed frame. But there were other technical innovations around in the mid-50s and one of the biggest names was Vincent. Now this Vincent Black Shadow, for instance, this is 1955. 140 mile an hour performance from this 1000 cc v-twin but some of the technical things with this would seem very odd in the time and it probably looks a bit odd now take this front end it's not as old-fashioned as it looks down at the bottom here we've actually got two front brakes so even though they might look a bit small that back to back there's the other one nicely finned over there cable operated but the thing is when you pull the front brake lever there's a balancing arm across the top which makes sure that both levers are pulled up equally so you get equal pressure under both brake drums. Very clever stuff. The front forks themselves, this part is rigid, those are actually called girdrolic because it's a mixture of a girder fork and a hydraulic ram down the, well not, not a ram but a shock absorber down the back there. Spring down the centre there so that gave you suspension pretty limited but nevertheless you can see it was incredibly firm, you didn't get any squirming up the front end on that. Now for its time, this layout was very modern because the engine itself formed part of the frame. See there's no front down tube there, the engine is in fact the frame. And hung on the back of it here is the rear suspension. Because this triangulated section here is a cantilever suspension, that whole section pivoted down here on this bearing. And there is your shock absorber unit with central spring. So Yamaha used that idea on their early two strokes as well. And it doesn't stop there. Again, it looks a bit quaint, but if you ever got a puncher on one of these, you undid this thumb screw at the side there and hinged up the whole rear section of the number, uh, number plate and the uh, rear mug guard, and you could pull the wheel out straight. Dead easy, no lifting over to one side. And look at this, it's got a centre stand on it. It's got a great big lever on the side here, so you didn't even have to spoil your boot on there. You just gave a big heave on this and heaved it up. But that's it, a 140 mile an hour motorbike. But uh, very neat, a lot of technical innovation. Now you cannot possibly mention the 50s and 60s without mentioning this, the BSA Gold Star. And this one, which is a 1960 DBD34, probably represents the pinnacle of the Gold Star's development. The Gold Star came about, by the way, in 1937. A Gold Star, a 350 at that time, had actually lapped Brooklands at 100 miles an hour and you were awarded a little pin badge with a Gold Star on it. Very nice, nice little bit of history that. But that's where the Gold Star name came from. 
But if you had one of these, you could have them in all sorts of guises. You could have it at this clubman, clubman's version. And in fact, when it was a clubman's, it used to win everything in the TT, in the clubman's races. It was absolutely unbeatable. It was a sort of fire blade of its day, if you like. A real brilliant bike. Looks It looks quite racy as well. I think the proportions of it are absolutely spot on. But this was so versatile a bike, not only could you have it in this road racer clubman version, but you could also have it in a motocross version and a trials version. And at one time, and there's a standard road version here next to me, and at one time, later in the 60s, they actually fitted the 650cc twin engine in to make a rocket gold star. So the gold star name lived on, even in twin cylinder guys. But a lovely, beautifully proportioned bike. Then, in 1959, Triumph introduced this. Cashing in on the name, this is the Triumph Bonneville. 650cc, aluminium head on the iron barrel, twin carbs, 120 mile an hour performance. And this bike established itself as the bee's knees, the top sports bike. And in fact, the Bonneville name lived on for all of Triumph's production at Meriden, and in fact, still lives on today, as you well know, with the latest Hinkley Triumph, the latest Bonneville. But that's it, the first one. But interestingly, at that same time, well, in 1958, Triumph were producing bikes like this. This is the Triumph 21, 350cc, unit construction engine. But look at all this tinware on it. You've got this at the back, which got the nickname of the bathtub because it looks like one if you turned it the other way up. It's all steel and a massive front mudguard there. Now, all this was designed to appeal to the motorist of the day, to keep him nice and clean. Not like a Bonneville or out in the raw, but this one, nice and clean, a civilised motorbike. And even though they sold, they didn't really catch on. But I tell you, Triumph weren't the only ones to do this sort of bike come car thing. There were other people too. In 1955, Vincent did this to the Black Shadow. They called this the Black Prince. All this is glass fiber covering the whole bike. Mind you, look at this vertical screen. It looks a bit odd, doesn't it? But mind you, this one would do 150 miles an hour. Now, no one wanted to get left out on the act and Royal Enfield produced this. Single cylinder, 350 and a 500, they call this the airflow. Big front mug guard and a glass fibre fairing. Even Vela set of all people tried to do it in 1959. With this, they covered up their beautiful engine with this nonsense of a glass fibre cowl. I just think it looks horrible and I thought it looked horrible at the time. Now, while all these were attempts at tidying up an existing motorcycle, in 1949, we're going back a bit now, Velocet came up with this, a completely new bike, monocoque construction, no normal tubular steel frame, but all pressed steel, the little LE. Those old enough might remember that the police used to use these. It's called noddy bikes, so the ordinary police patrolman used to get on one of these, and these were whisper quiet, flat twin, 192cc, shaft drive, water-cooled, absolutely silent the way you could creep up on anyone with them. Even a little hand starter, stop you messing up your boots. But later, 1958, Ariel, that renowned manufacturer of big four strokes, they came up with this, which might look a bit quaint now, but it was absolutely revolutionary in its time. And if you think now of new Yamaha's T-Max, the big scooter, you could almost think of this in this way, because this was a brand new bike, again, monocoque construction, big steel frame all the way through, Fancy trailing link front forks. Under there, there's a link that compresses the um, telescopic spring unit in the vertical leg. White wall tyres, like those, eh? Up here, you've got a little dashboard with a speedo and a clock. You've even got an adjuster to tip the headlamp up and down here for when you're carrying a passenger. It's got indicators on. The first bike that had indicators um, in the UK. A little luggage thing in there. Built-in panniers. Under all this, it's a two-stroke twin. I don't like two-strokes, but there we are. Two-stroke twin, very good, excellent performance in its age. And I so say you can now look at it and think, well, Yamaha have just brought out this big T-Max, and so perhaps this was a forerunner of that sort of big scooter. But they weren't the only one. Along there is um, Velocet. They bought out what was called the Velocet Vogue, which is simple LE water-cooled engine again, but they put some glass fibre around it, but it never really took off. But good old BSA weren't going to bother with all this streamlining malarkey. See this 1961 BSA Super Rocket? That engine and gearbox were basically unchanged from 1948, still separate, no concessions at all. But in 1964, they made a slight concession because a new engine design was unit construction. See that little egg shape? 650 and 500cc versions, but it didn't have the same charisma as the old A10. 
from a very famous name like BSA to a not so famous name like Royal Enfield, there was this, this absolutely gorgeous, well it is to me, 736cc 1970 Royal Enfield Interceptor, made right at the end of their existence, they went bust in that year, but this is a real cracker. Some beautiful engineering touches to it as well, it's not only got twin carbs, very easy tappet adjustment up there, and it's also got the oil in the sump, which was different for a British bike, normally they're in a separate oil tank. And here it's got a very neat gadget. If ever you've had trouble finding neutral on a bike, no trouble with this one. So no matter where the gear lever was, press down on there, that got you to neutral. But really a nice looking bike, 110, 120 mile an hour performance. And look at this, it's absolutely immaculate. Wouldn't like out of place outside a cafe now, would it? Now around the same time, Norton were developing their bikes and they take their 650cc engine, which was still in a featherbed frame and developed it to 750cc, but vibration, which is a big problem of the old British vertical twin, was becoming a real problem. So what they did, developed a new frame and they actually mounted the engine in rubber. They called it isoelastic engine suspension. And you can see one of them at the front here and there's another one at the back and it was all designed to damp out vibration. Mind you, on this bike, everything tended to shake, but I think by now, the writing was on the wall. Honda had already launched, in 1969, the first 754, which was super sophisticated. At the same time, our old friends Triumph were developing their own solution to vibration, and they came out with this. This is a three-cylinder, the Triumph Trident. Three-cylinder, 750cc, and in fact, if you look at this engine case, you can see the similarity with the old 500 because in fact all they did was slice off one cylinder, stick it on the end, making 750cc, new 320 degree crank, made a very, very smooth engine. And considering its old origins in 1938, this was a very, very quick motorcycle, at least 120 mile an hour, and in racing form it was incredibly fast. It won the Isle of Man TT in Slippery Sam guys, as it was often called. It won at Daytona. It beat the MV Augustas, written by Phil Reed and Agostini at Mallory Park. It did all sorts of things, but the engine was a little bit fragile and a bit complicated. And now and again, they had a horrible habit of just letting go. Of course, Triumph and BSA was in fact the same group. And so BSA produced their own 753, the Rocket 3. All they'd done was tilted the engine forward to make it look a little bit different. And I had one of these, but I had it nicked. I also had one of these. This is the Trident T160. This was produced in 1975. Again, engine sloping forward, but they bolted on an electric starter on this one, and it really is bolted on. It looks pretty crude. Put four pipes on as a bit of a styling cue, but it's only a three cylinder. But what was new was disc brakes front and rear. But by then, things were really going downhill fast. 1976 saw the end, I'm afraid, of uh, the Triumph Trident. But meanwhile, Norton were developing this, or rather they had it in production. They dropped the old vertical twin and they put in this massive engine. It's only 600cc, but it's a rotary engine, the Wankel engine, developed from a German design. Very good performance, but all sorts of problems with it, um, oil consumption-wise, heavy fuel consumption. But it was quite popular with the police for a while and very successful in British superbikes. And they had some terrific results and won the British Superbike Championship with Trevor Nation. But in 1994, I'm afraid, production of Norton's Rotary, that stopped. And that really was the end of British bike production until the new Triumph, the Hinkley Triumphs started. Well, that's it. That's 80 years of British bikes. We started in 1902, and what I've tried to do is cover a whole range of bikes, but I couldn't cover them all. I've tried to concentrate on those that move biking on in a technological fashion, new innovations and all the rest of it but I'm very conscious that I've missed out some perlers amongst this lot, but what else can you do? But the other significant thing that we've got to remember is that this has all been the British bike industry. Nothing about the world, there's no Harleys, no Italians in there, all British, such as this wonderful bruff. But I'm afraid that world is so big, I just won't have time to do that. Well, at least not in the near future. And coming up on Two Wheels After the Break, more from this year's Manchester Bike Show. Well, if you 
were watching last week, you'll remember that we brought to you some absolutely fantastic Street Fighter style machines here at the Manchester National Motorcycle Show. Well, we brought you some more, so take a look at this lot. This should take me a while, etching away at this like this. What a beautiful piece of artwork I've done there and the Street Fighter on here. <laughs> no, it is nice that though, isn't it? Etched into the mirror. Beautiful that. But we want to see the real thing. And if you really want to see the real thing, just check this little dude out. This is awesome. This is an award winning uh, Street Fighter in every shape and form. In fact, it's won 12 major awards. It's even won an award back at the Rock and Blues Festival and many, many more trophies to go with it. Best street fighter at Sheffield Arena, even. I mean, it is awesome, but what is it? Well, let's just start at the back and work our way forward. For example, the tailpiece. You must recognise the tailpiece. It's commonly used on street fighters. It's the 916, but obviously very heavily modified. The wheels, that wheel is a special billeted wheel. There's some serious engineering got into that wheel and must be worth an absolute fortune. And obviously there's a matching front one to go with it. But the paintwork is stunning, absolutely stunning. And they've included it on the frame. All the paint job goes right onto the frame. And that frame is a special one-off as well. By any chance, do you recognize that it's got a turbo on it? And that's a real special piece of turbo. And it's attached to the GSXR motor, which is a 1277cc. Obviously, originally started life out as an 1100. It is absolutely awesome, there's no question about it. You can recognise a few little component parts, but you've got to admit the fact that this tank here fits the framework beautifully, but do you recognise it? By any chance do you recognise it? Well, it's a ZXR 750 tank. And then it's inundated with all sorts of bits and pieces, like most Street Fighters are, that are special one-off engineered pieces all over the yoke here. And I mean, obviously, standard nice shiny levers to go with the job. The fairing, that's unique as well. Olin steering damper, and on a bike with such power delivery, it's got to have a steering damper naturally. Look at the front wheel and the billeted six pots here. This is another one to match the back. Beautifully handcrafted wheel. Fantastic, isn't it? Well, obviously, a piece of equipment like this must be worth a fortune. In this case, around 25, 27,000 pounds. Now, the proud owner of this and creator of this bike would never sell it. Even though it's worth all that money, he would never sell it. In fact, he'd prefer to go to bed with it, and I can understand why. And I bet a bike of this value must have some form of security device on it as well. Well, I can't see any LED flashing lights as though it's got an alarm or anything like that. I can't imagine what's... You obviously need a security device on... Uh, on the, oh, 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 missus. Oh, I've obviously done something now. Oh, good Lord. This bike will self-destruct in five seconds. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Oi, come here, come here, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about buying bits and pieces for your Street Fighter. So you go and buy a bit of a bashed up machine, broken fairing and so on and so forth, and you want to make it into a Street Fighter, but on the cheap. Well, it don't cost you a lot to buy the bits and pieces. You go into your local accessory shop, buy a few bits, or you just come to a bike show like this, big stand with all the bits you want, cheap. Look at this, 14 quid for a pair of anodized alloy bars. You can have a tailpiece for nine pounds or even an R1 lookalike unit for only 12 quid, a bargain. You get your indicators, flush fitting or the original indicators on a store. They don't cost you much, nine or 10 pounds. And just look at these. These are a beautiful pair. Oh, Hermes's, eh? Yes, they're proper headlights. These are actually approved for MOT standards as well. Chrome, and I've seen these on loads of Street Fighters and they only cost you 75 pounds. Beautiful. Very firm too, actually. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed that little look at some of the one-offs and some of the special Street Fighter bikes here at the show. And the fact is, we've only just really scratched the surface. Next time you go to a show, have a look around these one-offs. 
They're amazing. The workmanship, the creativity, the imagination, and not least of all, the money that's involved is quite staggering. But just for you people who are hoping to see some of the more regular production bikes, here's a very quick look around the rest of the show. And on Two Wheels next week, Wayne and I travel to Donington Park, the venue for the 2001 Trade Expo. This event is strictly trade only, but Wayne and I managed to sneak in with a Two Wheels camera to bring to you an exclusive look at some of the new products you'll be seeing on the dealer's shelves in the very near future.